Hello, I'm Tim Buchanan. I'm going to be doing a presentation on the oaks of Fort Collins, 26 different species of oaks and eight different hybrids grow in the city. And uh, I uh, am the retired city forester, done a full career as the city forester for four decades. Uh, I've had time to scout out all these different species that are growing on city property and uh, other areas in the city of Fort Collins. So, uh, The, uh, there's a handout that goes with this so you can track a few comments and information on each of the trees. We'll start out with the white oak group, then do the red oak group, but bur oak, probably the best known of a lot of our oaks and most adapted, a strong, strong stout tree, large branches. Here's a 130 old specimen on the Colorado State University campus there, uh, survived a lot of really cold winters. So it's a, a very good adapted oak, generally recommended, gets over uh, 60 to 70 feet tall. Here's a specimen that's probably about 45 feet tall. When younger, it's got kind of a broad oval canopy to it, but highly variable. Oaks are grown from seed, so each one is going to be different. Fir oak is one that puts a huge amount of energy into growing roots, which gives it a really good drought tolerance uh, capability. A good ID characteristic on bur oak is the leaf. Though in saying that, uh, oaks are polymorphous, which means that there's a lot of variability in leaf shapes. But if you take a close look at that leaf and turn the point down, it has that resemblance of a base fiddle. So that's a good uh, way of identifying bur oak. In the fall, though, you get a little bit of yellow brown, but there isn't any orange or red fall color in bur oak. And another good characteristics on identifying fir oak is the fringe at the top of the acorn cup cap. You can see these long finger-like uh, structures there that are uh, very distinct. You won't find any other oaks in our region that have that characteristic. Sometimes another name for it is mossy cup oak, so you can see where it got that. On the left there, you can see a specimen that's about 15 to 18 years old and uh, has a tighter pyramid shape, uh, kind of or a narrow oval shape there. So you can kind of see the form on that. <clears throat> One of the problems with the uh, bur oak is uh, an insect gall called bullet gall. Well named, you can see these little round galls that look like a, a bullet or a marble and a wasp lays an egg, causes the stem to grow around it. Then it attracts bees and other Loss that can be a hazard to people getting stung. So this is a, a, a safety hazard and it's uh, unsightly. So having burr oaks that are gall free is a major objective in horticulture, urban forestry in our area along the, the front range. So in Fort Collins, we've made a selection that we have found that is bulletproof. So this particular tree here that is being put in production by Plant Select uh, with the cultivar name Bulletproof is resistant to the bullet gall. And uh, we've also have the name Choice City, which means that it's uh, being promoted by Plant Select. But uh, very nice oak, big, uh, large leaves, uh, small. It has a tight oval, developing a little bit broader oval in time, fast growing. So structure, it's a really good uh, yard or street tree and it's resistant to bulletproof. So when you buy bulletproof, you know you won't be getting that, that bullet gall, which is uh, a safety hazard and a aesthetic problem. Our second oak in the white oak group is Trinkapan oak, Quercus muhlenbergia. This is a newcomer, relatively speaking, to the front range in Fort Collins. Before 1995, there weren't any Trinkapan oaks <clears throat> in Fort Collins. Today, there's over 800 and doing well, adapted to high pH soils. It's generally recommended. It can get over 50 foot tall, broad oval canopy. Some have good fall color to them. Uh, so chinkapin is, is one that is being recommended for ash replacement now that we're right in the midst of the emerald ash borer epidemic. Another look at four chinkapin oaks. And oaks, again, are almost always grown from seed. And so you can see the variability from tree to tree. They're all going to be a little different because they're getting genetic recombination and <clears throat> the acorn production, which can be a nice element in the urban forest. 
some cases you want that uniformity or a formal look. And there are a few clones available, but most of our, many of our oaks are grown from seed. So you can see that variability. The leaf on chinkapin is unique in that it kind of looks like a chestnut leaf if you're familiar with that species. Another common name that is sometimes used for chinkapin oak is yellow chestnut oak. So you can see those around <clears throat> uh, nine to 12 lobes with a slight pointed gland at the end of the leaf there, the, the lobes and the acorn there, that it would be typical for chinkapin. The, the acorn is not as bitter as many of the oaks, so it's uh, for wildlife, though I, I found that almost all oaks are, are get attacked by uh, squirrels and things. It is a, a sweeter acorn. The bark on chinkapin kind of interesting for winter interest, this kind of white ashy gray with the scales on it. Particularly in the winter, kind of that white look is kind of a nice ornamental characteristic. The tree on the left is just uh, one that was planted in the park that caught my interest because of its really nice shape in terms of its pyramidal form. And so this is one when you see in the landscape that you promote for putting into production to be grown asexually, but wouldn't this be a, a, a really good tree to plant in place of where a lot of lindens have been cited that, that aren't doing well because of the heat and scorch and the salt problems with that species. So uh, Plant Select may be wanting to take a look at this pyramidal linden in one of the Fort Collins parks. A few have really good fall color, not all, some orange, a very few red, some just yellow, but uh, this one has been noted to have outstanding red fall color and Plant Select is putting this into production as Choice City and there's some nurseries that are producing this right now. So look for Choice City, the red chinkapin oak uh, for uh, that, that beautiful fall red color there. Now there's a dwarf chinkapin oak that is uh, uh, similar to the regular chinkapin but smaller, usually not over 25 feet. So it's generally recommended as these first two oaks were, no major critical health factors associated with them. Uh, but dwarf chinkapin is extremely rare in Colorado, which is a shame. It uh, has some characteristics of gamble oak, small multi-stem tree, but mostly smaller and lower branch compared to the larger version of chinkapin oak. So here's dwarf chinkapin oak. You can see it's spreading more uh, smaller size. Another characteristic I've noticed this tree is in my landscape that it has really good shade tolerance. Uh, so that's a, an option for planting in areas where you have canopy trees to have a smaller growing oak and good fall color. So dwarf chinkapin oak, look for it. And uh, hopefully nurseries will be seeing that there potentially some good demand on this and putting it in production in the future. Leaves are very similar to the regular chinkapin oak, but a, a fewer lobes, usually about eight or nine of those lobes with the gland at the tip compared to maybe 10 or 11 on regular chinkapin. But other than that, it's just smaller and, uh, and branch lower. Acorn on the left for dwarf chinkapin, which the scientific name is Quercus pronoides. And then on the right, the, the scaly bark that you can see there. When I was taking this photograph, I noticed this broken branch on this uh, one dwarf chinkapin. I was kind of scratching my head why that had occurred. And uh, yeah, there was a heavy acorn crop. So I suspect there was about a 40 pound raccoon that was up foraging those acorns. Now the next oak I'll present is swamp white oak and it can be a big tree over 50 foot tall, but I have it and you'll see this in the handout as conditionally recommended not generally recommended, conditionally because it's sensitive to high pH soils. Anything over about 7.5, you're gonna get chlorosis in. And in Fort Collins, many of our soils are eight. So it's difficult to grow this. A few have survived in South Fort Collins and would be good seed trees that hopefully uh, transmit that, that higher pH tolerance. But it is, uh, it is a problem in high pH soils. Here's leaf on, uh, swamp white oak, lobes somewhat like chinkapin, but fewer, and then the strong wedge shape at the, at the base of, of the leaf there. Uh, swamp white will tend to have a strong central leader, and the branches horizontal, maybe bending down a little at the tip. 
not uh, any fall color, but adapted to heavy soils, clay uh, situations, but not to high pH. Here's a swamp white leaf showing the early stages of intravenal chlorosis, which is a sign that it's uh, showing the nutrient deficiency from, from iron. So that's the, the element that uh, can cause the chlorosis and problems in pHs over 7.5. So there's a lot of, there's places in Denver and Boulder and Longmont where this can be grown, but be careful if you know you have higher pH close to eight because you're gonna get iron chlorosis. Here's the acorn on swamp white as a long stalk and has a very small fringe that you can see on that uh, acorn cap. So good characteristic identification. The bark is white and scaly, somewhat like chink up in there, uh, but the leaves are different and the shape is different there. So English oak, I have that as a conditionally recommended species uh, in uh, Fort Collins and I think along the front range. Because of it's not universally cold hardy, and some are not adapted to our soils. Many nice English oak, some okay, and then some that are just uh, suffering freeze damage and chlorosis. So there's the uncertainty of what you would get when you plant English oak. This is a beautiful tree, would be a great seed tree to use. We need to pay more attention to uh, growing English oak from proven trees along the front range that have done well in high pH soils and survived a lot of the hard early and late freezes over the years. The leaves have kind of a medium distinct green to them, lobed, and right at the base, if you look at the base of that leaf, it has a couple of little lobes, called those ear lobes. It technically it's called articulate base, really short petiole. The acorns on, on English oak, Quercus rober, have a long stalk and a really small cap, very distinct. The bark is deeply furrowed and can be a big tree, it can get over 60, to 70 feet tall. I've seen some huge, nice specimens uh, in the Denver area at Fairmont Cemetery. Uh, but watch out, be careful if you don't know the seed source because you could have problems with free damage and some chlorosis. White oak, or the eastern white oak, Quercus alba, I put on the potential but unproven. Now this is, these are trees that are, uh, one or more have done well in Fort Collins and it looks like it has some some potential, but it's it's unproven. Now, Quercus alba, there's only two that I know of in, in Fort Collins doing well. Uh, so a lot more needs to be learned. I think at this stage, planting a few for arboretum purposes or in soils that are known to be lower pH would would be uh, the, the objective there. This is one, when you see trees like this, you wonder how many were planted, how many survived. There were five planted. And this is the only one that survived. And it's down near the, close to the Poudre River where the pHs are, are lower. Beautiful color, this kind of green, almost pink color, distinct of white oak, Quercus alba, a great characteristic, but potential, but unproven. Be cautious with high pH uh, soils. Planting a few or as an arboretum tree on good soils is really the good objective. It can be a big tree, over 50 feet tall. Here's the lobing on white oak, sometimes used in, in art and illustrations because of how common it is. And the bark on white oak, uh, scaly, small plates, somewhat similar to chink up in there. And then you can see the leaves and the texture on the right. If you look close, you can see there's a good acorn crop coming on, those small acorns coming out on this Quercus alba. So just a couple in Fort Collins, has some potential, but unproven, a big tree, but be cautious, probably arboretum and very selective planting is the way to go on it. <clears throat> now Mongolian oak, Quercus mongolica, uh, a couple in Fort Collins, I think it has good potential, but it's unproven because there's only a few. This is one at the Colorado State University campus by the Plant Science Building. It was a small tree when I was a student there years ago. Um, and there's kind of a mystery who planted it. There was confusion on what it is, but a smaller shade tree, probably 45 to 50 feet tall, very cold hardy, being grown in the Dakotas uh, there and even in Montana. So it has good adaptability to soils. Here's the leaf on this Mongolian oak, which is somewhat different than a lot of the species. So this is probably a, just a form. Usually Mongolian oak has more lobing to it on the trees that I've seen. But every other characteristic of this tree I've identified very closely with uh, Quercus mongolia, mongolica, mongolian oak. 
Here's the tree there, low branch. Again, it's gonna be just a smaller shade tree there by the plant science building. If you kind of read between the branches, you can see the end of plant and science there to the right there. So uh, somebody planted this probably <clears throat> 50 to 55 years ago, and it's a nice tree on the campus today. Now here's a really unusual tree, and some of these are represented by only one or two, and maybe only the few uh, in Colorado or in Fort Collins, Persian oak, Quercus macranthera. It's from uh, the country of Turkey and the Caucasus Mountains, the country of Georgia and north of Iran, that part of the world there. Fortunate to have gotten a specimen. So it appears to have some potential, but it's really unproven. I think planting it as a, an arboretum tree or for a collector would be the way to proceed right now. It's a little bit smaller than a lot of the oaks, probably a 45, 50 feet would be a, a big one. Multiple lobes on it, really short petiole. There it has that lobes at the base, which we call auriculate. The acorns are large and the buds very distinct, good identification characteristic with these long uh, bud scales and hairs at the, uh, that it almost enclose it. So, uh, Persian oak, one to, to think about trying one for a botanic garden or a collector. And there's three that I know of in Fort Collins, a couple in a city nursery, and, and then one in the City Park Arboretum, which is a arboretum in Fort Collins with over 220 different species and varieties. If you haven't visited, it'd be a, a great chance to, to, to learn some of the trees that are growing in Fort Collins. The next white oak, sawtooth oak, Quercus acutissima, well named because of the edge of the leaf looks like a saw. It can get to be a fairly big oak, over 50 feet tall. A few have survived in Fort Collins. Some have not. This is a great specimen in the old section of town. There are distinct texture to it, can hold its dry wintered leaves. As an interesting acorn, I'll show you in a couple of future slides. Parts of the country is being planted for wildlife because the, the acorns are relished by uh, turkey and deer. So here's the leaf on sawtooth, you can see it's well named with that saw-like edge on the leaf there. So uh, I probably in my career, I probably planted 10 and I think five have survived, most of those in the old section of Fort Collins. Kind of interesting, but typically they do hold a lot of those brown withered leaves, we call it marcescent there, that some people really enjoy and others don't prefer that as much. Here's the bark on sawtooth oak. And the acorn, those acorn scales are like large fingers that come up and partially enclose the acorn there. So again, probably it has some potential, but is largely unproven. I believe the state champion trees at the Regis University Arboretum, uh, but probably for arboretums and collectors would be the primary interest. Now, post oak, Quercus stellata, and you might say if you're familiar with that species, where's the post oak? But it's the middle tree. Uh, in that group there, which is the tallest in the center, Quercus stellata. Uh, there's a population of, of, of oaks in the panhandle of Texas near Wheeler, Texas. It's a, what we call a hybrid swarm where, the, swarm where there's uh, post oak, moor oak, Harvard shin oak have mixed it up genetically. And some of, the, some of them down there have strong resemblance to post oak. So that's where this tree came from, but you can see it's distinct leaf that is a post oak leaf that looks like a cross there. That's a good identification. Now, from this population, probably trees aren't gonna be over about 30 feet tall. And some of them, because it's a hybrid mix of, uh, are gonna to go toward the other parents. Now, post oak, just the species that we know in the east, would probably be difficult to grow in our high pH soils. I've not tried to grow just the eastern uh, post oak but I think pH sensitivity would be a, a factor with post oak. Here's some post oaks that I grew in my, my backyard experimental nursery there from that tree I just showed you and ended up with five trees that planted 15, kept five, and these were sited in uh, Fort Collins parks this, uh, this last spring so that uh, uh, we can further evaluate how they're doing. Could be good seed trees for the future. So from this population, uh, 35, 40 foot trees from the Panhandle of Texas, 
arboretums, botanic gardens may want to be trying them. Uh, but if you're doing the eastern post oak, probably lower pH soils are going to be necessary to grow. Now here's a uh, here's a oak that I'm I'm really quite interested in. It's uh, it has really good potential, but unproven. It's Harvard Shin Oak. This grows in the the prairie and plains of West Texas and East New Mexico, forming colonies. Very very drought tolerant. Has a strong resemblance to uh, to gamble oak. In it. So using this in dry landscapes, drainage ways, low maintenance landscapes could be an advantage. Here's the leaf on it does have some resemblance to our gamble oak there and the acorns, which these aren't quite ripe, but it's a large acorn, almost an inch in diameter from the Harvard Shin Oak, but maybe a little bit re more refined than some of the clump um, uh, gamble oak that we plant. So this you know, this particular grove of three, I think maximum height of 25, they're spreading, they're suckering some. And for nurseries that want to see if they could develop a market for this or put it into production, these have been producing heavy acorn crops. And please contact me if you're interested in the location, would like to get some acorns on Harvard Shin Oak. And these are trees originally came from seed collected from the Xeriscape Garden at the Denver Botanic Gardens. Here's an oak that just shouldn't be in Fort Collins, Valley Oak, Quercus lobeta, the big oak of the Central Valley of California there. Uh, we planted maybe about eight or 10 from a high elevation source in California, which had a colder region that were grown in a nursery in Albuquerque and then planted in Fort Collins. And three of them have survived today, though they, they haven't been real happy. There's been some freeze damage, particularly this last couple of years from fall and spring freezes. So here's the leaf on Quercus lobeta, very distinct identification feature on the, the valley oak there. These are big spreading trees that uh, in their native range can get over 100 foot tall with large spread. These I don't think will ever get that big and it's, you know, they're really just unproven and probably not a market for doing them other than somebody botanically who would want to uh, try them in an arboretum or as a collector. Here's the acorns on Valley Oak, this long pointed nut there, a small cap, very, very distinct. And here's the national champion Valley Oak in the north part of the Central Valley there, so you can get an idea of how huge it is. Just a great, huge specimen there. This was at the International Oak Society tour. We stopped and visited this tree, 130 feet tall. and. Uh, uh, I don't think ours are ever going to look like this, but we do have the three specimens in Fort Collins that are that are surviving, but they have not produced any seed, but would be a, a good seed source for those who want to want to try a couple of valley oaks. Hungarian oak, Quercus freneto from Southern Europe. This is the cultivar forest green. And it's the, the only one I planted uh, 15 to 20 years ago. And it's held up in the freezes and uh, early and hard, late freezes has been adapted to soils. So this is in the old part of Fort Collins with lower pH. So I did plant uh, some that weren't this cultivar, I should say, uh, this was the only forest green and they have had freeze damage on them. So it has some potential, it's unproven, it's in the trade. I think it might've been a Schmidt selection, go slow on it, though we do have this forest green Hungarian oak that survived for 15 plus years in, in Fort Collins there. Interestingly, multiple lobe, short petiole there, uh, brown to yellow fall color, nothing really, really outstanding. Here's the bark, light color. You can, if you look at the lower part of the stem on that, you can see the graft. It may have been grafted on to, to uh, English oak, that I, I, I don't know but can get to be a fairly good sized tree, uh, 40 to 60 feet, and the forest green has that tighter uh, pyramidal canopy. So, so might be worth trying a few, uh, but be cautious on planting forest green uh, Hungarian oak. Emperor oak, Quercus dentata. I've seen a, a couple in Denver, and there's a couple in Fort Collins uh, that have survived. So I think it has some potential, but it's unproven, 
a lot more to learn about it. One of the trees in Fort Collins at the City Park Arboretum has a little bit of chlorosis, uh, not readily available in the trade, which is characteristic of some of, some of these that are, there's only one or two that we have planted in the city. Uh, but this one's doing quite well, and interesting leaf on it, uh, whiter at the middle and the outer part, multiple lobes there, but a real good identification characteristic on emperor oak is this acorn. That's a really attractive acorn fringe on that. I was able to collect a couple of, uh, of acorns off of this tree and send it to a, a friend in Denver who germinated them and she has them growing. The bark also is distinct with that dark color and deep fissure. So a good way to identify emperor oak. So botanic gardens, collectors, uh, one on a project, challenging to find, but the old saying, you don't know if you don't grow, can get to be a medium to larger tree where it's native range in Japan and China. So at the Gardens on Spring Creek, Fort Collins Botanic Garden, there's an oak grove in the Foothills Garden that was, garden was just planted over the last couple of years. And the area you're looking at uh, in the center of the slide has the species of oak that are found in Colorado, plus what we call species of origin that have lent their genes to some of the hybrids. So you have gray oak, moor oak, gamble oak, turbinell oak, and then uh, specimens that show genetics in the gamble oak population from bur oak and post oak. So this would be gonna be a great area to represent the, the different genetic diversity of oak in Colorado. Uh, the first native oak of Colorado that's in the, that I'm, I'll talk about in the, uh, um, the oak grove is turbinella oak. A lot of times there's some freeze damage problems with these, but there's a population west of Pueblo in Fremont County on the road to Victor, right where the pavement ends, that have grown uh, trees from, uh, trees or shrubs, small trees, that uh, has distinct turbinella oak characteristics that uh, has proven to be really cold hardy, no freeze damage over the last couple of years where we've had these really bad spring and fall storms. So here's the, the foliage on the turbinella oak from the Fremont County population. Acorns, they're producing acorns as small size plants there. And so uh, these, these oaks in Fremont County have mixed with some of the gamble oaks and even gray oak. So there's hybrids, but there are some distinct turbinella oaks right in this population. And we've got uh, about eight of those growing in Fort Collins areas right now producing seed. And several of those are at the, the gardens on Spring Creek. We've added the cultivar name to our turbinella oaks, Wild Dog, Quercus turbinella wild dog. This is a tag at one at the gardens on Spring Creek. And we use that name because the morning I collected seed years ago, there was a pack of feral dogs and the turbinella Oaks, be, uh, when I got there early in the morning, I had to wait until they cleared out before I could go up and collect seed there. Another native species that is very rare in Colorado is Quercus grissy, a gray oak. A few specimens can be found down in southeast uh, Colorado in Baca County in the Black Mesa region. And they've grown a, a few trees from this population, but there's mixed genes. So when you collect off a a gray oak in southeast Colorado, you may only get one or two of, of 10 that go toward the parent of origin, which is gray oak. So that's what this is. This is at the Gardens in Spring Creek, a specimen that clearly is identified as Quercus grissia gray oak. This is a, a tree from this genetic source. It's probably only get 25 or 30 feet tall. It's come through some outdoors, uh, some really cold winters the last couple of years and freezes. So it's proven to be a good cold hardy specimen there. Here's the leaf on it, well named because the leaves are gray. Somebody told me one time it looks like there was dust that had settled on the leaves, but I like the texture. I like that gray, almost blue look to it. And as small plants, they're producing acorns. So there's possibility you could get a seed off of the ones at the gardens on Spring Creek where there's a couple of uh, specimens that I've identified in, south in Southeast Colorado that have produced a lot of, uh, lot of acorns. So Quercus grissia, I think it's potential, it's unproven, 
that looks good from this seed source, but I think at this time, not being in production, that it's the arboretums and botanic gardens that would be interested in it. Now, another species of oak found in Southeast Colorado is more oak, Quercus moriana. It also grows right in this area where the gray oaks are located. It has a lot of similarities, similar to gray oak. This is in the oak grove at the gardens on Spring Creek. Possibly it could get 15 to 25 feet tall, uh, can spread, be broad spreading, can do some suckering, has this leaf similar to gray oak with the entire leaf margin without any uh, uh, lobes or, or spines usually on the, on the leaf margin. And they're shiny on the top compared to gray oak, and they're a little bit different green, but very close in their resemblance. So we have this specimen of more oak at the uh, Gardens on Spring Creek in the oak grove. And I'm not aware of, maybe there's some at the Denver Botanic Garden, but this is a very, very rare plant in Colorado, but it is native to Colorado. And there are some that are clearly identified as more oak in Southeast Colorado. So it's great that we can represent this native oak, even though with only a, a couple of specimens uh, in botanic gardens in, in Colorado. Here's more oak uh, leaf. It's shiny on top, usually not as long or pointed as gray oak. Acorns on more oak uh, uh, that the cap encloses a little more of the nut than on gray oak. But there's just a lot of similarities between uh, these two species. Now the wavy leaf oak, the Quercus undulata, a lot of people call this a complex because it appears that there's a mix of species that have come together to form this hybrid swarm, turbinella, gray oak, moor oak, gamble oak, and possibly others. There's thousands, if not millions of them in the southern tier of counties in southeast Colorado. Every one of them is a little different because there's a mix of four or more species there. Some can be small trees up to 25 feet tall, others more shrub-like. Some will sucker, some are gray, some are shiny, and some are dark green. So here's the wavy leaf oak, the Quercus undulata, very, very drought tolerant. So I think as a, as a designer, landscape architect, to tag the one you want that has the shape and form and leaf uh, is the way to go. Specifying it, you're just gonna get a, a lot of variability. Maybe planting more as a specimen uh, or a, a grove in natural areas would be be a, a way to proceed on this. But once you water them, get them established, you'll never have to water them again. Here's wavy leaf oak uh, that is showing more characteristic of the gamble oak parent there. And here's a wavy leaf oak that's showing more characteristics of the gray oak parent. So when you're carrying genes from four or five different species, if you grow enough seedlings, some of them will sort out to the species of origin. And that's what you see on wavy leaf oak, a great native plant, very drought tolerant, and for less manicured landscapes or zerg gardens, it's a it's a great tree to, to grow in. All of them are different. So heavy acorn producers at small sizes, these acorns will ripen fairly early in the season, usually mid-August, if you're gonna collect for wavy leaf oak is the time to get out and do it. Now, gamble oak, and I put complex there because as I've studied gamble oak over the last 20 years, it became really difficult for me to conclude that it's just a species. Um, we should call it gamble oak, the taxonomy as it identified as Quercus gambelia, but I tag it with complex because everything that you see in the population indicates there's a mix of three or more species that are part of the gamble oak population here. So you've got the You've got the gamble oak, you've got bur oak, you have post oak, you have the southeast oaks of turbinella oak, gray oak, and moor oak that show up in, in some of the progeny of the gamble oak population. If you look at this picture in Rossboro Park, you can see the, the 30 inch diameter tree kind of in the center. There's a lot of 25, 15 to 25 year feet multi stem trees, and then you have the knee high clonal trees up on the hillside. So it's just genetically a real mix. So here's some F1 leaves, first generation from trees, uh, seed collected in the wild of what we would call gamble oak based on current taxonomy. Upper left looks like a post oak, the one on the right looks like a bur oak, bottom left, what I think true gamble oak looks like. And on the right, you can see the points and the spines that indicate turbinella oak uh, intergression into them. 
So again, I, I just call it complex. That's just Tim Buchanan's way of saying, I, I think there's more than one species. Horticulturally speaking, it just adds a lot of diversity to the plant. So they can be small, uh, medium, or even up to medium large trees here. Here's something that might be kind of typical, a multi-stem suckering, great in a dry landscape, but not a real super refined plant. Boy, you have to admire its toughness and it's a native. Here's a tree form, which is perhaps there's more demand for. This is in my neighborhood, a tree that was planted about 40 years ago, is about 45 foot tall. That's got a good acorn crop on it. I'm gonna be growing some from this tree this year to see if I can replicate that with a fairly high percentage. But if we had something like this that you knew was going to be a tree form, and you know, for a small land, small lot, 45 feet tall uh, at this size in a smaller backyard shade tree is would has a area that that certainly could be planted. Now in horticulture where there have been crosses made between the gamble oaks and the bur oak, this is one in the City Park Arboretum tree that I just really admire because it's got this pyramidal habit, very low maintenance, moderate growth to it, planted about 18, 15 years ago. And uh, I think this is one that when you look at trees for selection, organizations like Plant Select may want to look at this. Very drought tolerant, tough, again, where we plant lindens on sites that they tend to, to decline and, and scorch. This would be a great tree to be put in production. It's in the City Park Arboretum of Fort Collins. Now there is a, a, a cultivar, though it's seed grown, Quercus gambelli Gila monster. It's from the Gila wilderness area of New Mexico, which is on the west side and the south part of New Mexico. And the Gamble Oaks genetics are different down there. They get to be big trees. On the left, you can see the three gentlemen standing by this tree that is a seed tree for Gila monster. Scotch Cocoa Bow chief propagator is the, the, the man at the left there. But here's a on the right is a nursery that has grown uh, seedlings from the Gila monster, they call it that cultivar, though it's seed grown. This area has been exposed to 30 below zero occasionally, though it's not as a cold and harsh as Colorado. So be looking for, when you want a good tree form, starting to be put in production. I know Fort Collins Wholesale is, is, is growing from this seed tree here as a good tree form of gamble oak. Gila monster. Now let's transition into the, the red oaks. We've completed the, the white oak groups. The red oaks tend to have uh, spines on the tips or bristles. It takes two years for them to ripen their acorns. But we'll start off with northern red oak. Quercus rubra can be a, a large tree, 70 to 80 foot tall. It can be a beautiful specimen there. You know, moderate water use to maybe low water use, some fall color. But sensitive to high pH, so I was over 7.5, we have problems growing that in Fort Collins. In the old section of Fort Collins, there's a few nice specimens. There's certainly a lot of places in Denver and Longmont and Boulder where northern red Quercus rubic can be grown. Recently, Schumard oak and Texas reds have been planted a lot, and they have a lot of similarities. Note on this picture, leaf picture, the, the base of a northern red Quercus ruba has a wedge shape. It's not just cut square across and the lobes are not as deep as they are those round u-shaped lobes as they are on Schumard oak and Texas red oak. Here's acorn on northern red. A large acorn has a little bit of a red or chestnut color on the acorn and the bark which can be just highly variable. Uh, many will have these long linear plates but not all. And the buds are a good way to distinguish northern red Quercus rubra from the Schumard oak and Texas red oak. The northern red will have a reddish or chestnut color bud, often with some hairs or wooliness right at the tip. Schumard and Texas red have light brown uh, or straw colored buds. And I'll show you the difference in leaf in a minute when we get to those two species. Here's the northern red oak state champion in City Park and Fort Collins a beautiful 85 foot specimen. The Arbor Climbing Championship was held in that tree a few years ago. Uh, 
planted probably about 130 years back. People used to come out on the park on the weekend to enjoy it and go back into Fort Collins, ride the trolley car, which uh, goes right up to the tree, used to pass by it there. Gives some fall color. Uh, generally, Texas reds and schumards are a little better than northern red, but, but not all, always. And so let's transition then to Schumard oak. It's another red oak with a lot of characteristics similar to northern red, uh, but it has tolerance to high pH soil. So if you're above 7.5 up to 8 or low 8s, Schumard oak is a red oak that you can grow. And it tends to be more of a southern species. So it is in uh, south, central, eastern Kansas, the southern half of Missouri, but it's also down in Oklahoma and Texas. So paying attention to provenance can be important in, in growing Schumard. But our interest in Fort Collins was its tolerance to high pH soil where we couldn't grow northern red and get that good red fall color. But take a look at this leaf here, the square cut across the base. Uh, use your imagination, but it's not that wedge shape. It tends to be square and the lobes are deep, deeper uh, than on northern red. So that's one way to tell it. Be careful in the nurseries because these can sometimes be confused. Acorns, uh, a larger acorn and usually not a red color on the acorn uh, cap at all. But the buds, if you remember that northern red, it had kind of a reddish color to it uh, and wooliness right at the tip. These are light brown and straw color. Just an excellent way to tell Schumard and Texas red that both have these light color buds from northern red plus the base of the leaf there. Here's bark on Schumard, but again, it can be highly variable. Generally, the the ridges and the plates are smaller than on northern red, but again, a high degree of, of variability. Good red fall color can be kind of an orange red to, uh, to just a wine red red color on, on Schumard. And uh, so before 1995, we had no Schumards that I knew of in Fort Collins, but today there's over six or 700 that have been planted that are, are, are doing, doing well. One of the problems with, with Schumert is this uh, uh, low stem damage from freeze. So this injuries at the base occur when there's quick early freezes or late freezes, particularly from southern seed sources. So finding a seed source more, more to the north, the north and west part of the range is objective I've been working on. So in Kansas, about 50 miles, 40 to 50 miles south of Topeka, at Lake Melbourne at Outlet Park. I've collected seed from this part of the Northwest extension of Schumard Oak. Here's a three-year-old tree from this population that is put on really, really good growth that will have better cold hardiness than some that have been brought up from, from the more Southern areas in, in Oklahoma. So Schumard Oak, uh, a really good high pH tree can get to be a big shade tree over 60 foot tall, really good red fall color, uh, really try to get more than northern seed sources. Now, before I get into Texas red oak, here's an illustration in the field guide of Texas, uh, should have been a field guide of, I left the F out, uh, by Benny Simpson. And so the blue is the Schumard oak in East Texas. The orange color is an intermediate form of Schumard and Texas red, and the yellow is Texas red. So you have this transition from Schumer to Texas red and intermediate forms. And the two species are very, very similar. So you'll see true Texas reds in the intermediate forms uh, that have been planted a lot in West Texas and the panhandle of Texas, Amarillo and Lubbock there. And so you can get Texas red and then you can get the intermediate forms between Schumard and Texas red and they're virtually impossible to, to separate them out. So here is a, a true Texas red there, also known as Buckley Oak. I rather like that name uh, and I'm advocating its use at the Gardens on Spring Creek, planted about 18 years ago, watered for four or five years, and then hasn't been watered since. Great fall color, never have had any freeze damage. Here's the leaves on Texas red. Typically they'll have less of those bristles Per leaf than Schumard has. Uh, so that's one way to separate them out. The acorns are smaller than on Schumard and the acorn caps are smaller. The buds are very similar 
on, on Schumer. And it's a smaller tree. So look for a shade tree that's maybe 45 to 50 foot tall, but gives you the outstanding red color and excellent drought tolerance, high pH tolerance. So here's the, the irrigation system. The drip tube has been act, inactive for almost 15 years. The tree is doing fine and putting out a second flush of growth. I know there's a really nice specimen in the Xeriscape Garden at the Denver Botanic Gardens. So Texas Red Oak or Buckley Oak, uh, Quercus buckleyi, is a great tree that should be planted a lot. It's generally recommended as a Schumard Oak. Uh, I would back up and say Northern Red Oak is only conditionally recommended because of its sensitivity to the high pH soils. And this wine red fall color is just great. So being a, from the South, even though it shows amazing cold hardiness, it, uh, it defoliates late. So when you look at these pictures, particularly one on the left, you can see the ash and hackberry have already defoliated. So you'll be into the first few days of November when you're getting this fall color that can be nice, but you do run the risk of some snow breakage. I've been looking and, and identifying a lot of the good Texas red oaks in Fort Collins as seed trees. So a good place to get your Texas oak, red oak acorns or buckley oak acorns Proven, proven seed sources, Fort Collins there, I just threw the sign in to identify that's the area. High elevation, so we have trees that have been 20 years in the landscape being good seed producers uh, and, and making good seedlings. So not all trees make good seedlings. So we're, I've been able to narrow that down and working with some of the cutting edge nurseries to provide them seedlings or uh, acorns to grow their seedlings to get it into production. And so here's a Texas red oak, a two-year-old tree. You can show the rapid growth starting to turn uh, fall colored. It'll be a, a just a wine red uh, before, it, uh, before it defoliates. Now similar species to Texas red on that diagram, excuse me, on that uh, diagram that I showed you, of going across Texas from Schumard, the mix of Schumard and Texas Red, and then Texas Red way out in the Davis uh, Mountain Country, uh, almost toward El Paso, is another red oak and it's Graves Oak. And it has just lots of similarities to Texas Red there, grows in some incredibly dry areas. Uh, here's the leaf on Graves Oak. I just have it as, uh, as unproven. Uh, I think a arboretum or a collector might be interested in them, but I think the Texas Reds have better cold hardiness than the, the Quercus Gravesi. Yeah, here's the acorns on, on uh, the Graves Oak here, and uh, the buds have that light color, though they are somewhat woolly, similar to the, uh, the Texas Reds and the Schumards. Now another uh, red oak changing the, the native range going up into the upper Midwest into Minnesota uh, and Wisconsin is Northern Pin Oak, Quercus ellipsodallis, not the regular Pin Oak that we know that doesn't really do very well. Has really great red fall color, great cold hardiness, but I found that over about 7.5 or 7.8 pH, it starts to get chlorosis. So this is a nice tree in Old Fort Collins, I bought 20. Uh, planted one in Old Fort Collins, the other 19 went in South Fort Collins with higher pH soils. They slowly got chlorotic and, and were not kept in the landscape. But this one, where the pH is a little bit lower, uh, has made just a really great tree. So again, I think there are places in Denver and Boulder and Longmont and in the old section of Fort Collins where this could be grown. But if you know you're up around eight pH, it's not gonna work. It can be a big shade tree, it can be 60 foot plus. Turns early, really nice red fall color. Here's the leaf on the northern pen. Looks somewhat similar to some of the other red oaks we've been looking at there. The buds are, uh, are good identification characteristics where there's kind of that brown ridge right on the edge of the bud. And the, the acorn has a, an elliptic shape, the scientific name Quercus ellipsodallis. That's where the, the name comes from on northern pen very rare in the front range. And so I think it can be planted as long as you know your pHs aren't, uh, aren't too, too high there. Now here's just an anomaly. You get, you get surprised sometimes what you find out in the landscape. And this tree was 
shipped in from a, a grower years ago and we planted it in a parkway. Not quite sure what it was, but it was an order of chinkapin oak. And then we took a closer look at it and identified it as Quercus nigra water oak. And, uh, and it has just done really well in a narrow parkway that gets limited irrigation on a busy street. Everything you would read about this species would say no way, no how, but this can be a big tree where it grows, but uh, this specimen is doing well. You can see a Siberian elm sprout that's right at the base there. Every time I take my camera over there, I want to take my pruners and get that cut out there. But Quercus nigra, water oak, just a really surprise. So, you know, I put it as potential but unproven if it's grown from this particular seed tree. But uh, this would be for somebody who wants to, to give it a shot and see if the progeny would have the adaptability of the parent. Here's the bark on water oak, but certainly not a proven tree in our area, but that's the way you get these in production is to find one or two or more that have done really well, use them as, as seed trees and, uh, and see how they do with further trials. Now the last one is not recommended, it's pin oak, Quercus palustris. In Fort Collins, it's, uh, this is what it looks like. It gets very chlorotic, dies kind of a slow lingering death. Uh, you need to have low pH soils to grow it. I know where they can grow it successfully in Boulder and probably parts of Denver, the Kermie scale has been a real problem on it. So I put it on the, the, the do not plant list and uh, don't confuse it with Northern Pen, which can be a nice oak for the, the 7.5 and below pH, but not not the pen oak, uh, Quercus palustris there. So here's the, here's the yellow foliage there. And so we do have some hybrid oaks in uh, Fort Collins. There's eight hybrids. I showed you the 26 species. And here is the, uh, the hybrids that have been in. Crimson Spire is a well-known hybrid between white and English oak. Tight pyramid, great fall color, holds the dry wintered leaves for an accent. Regal Prince, Seems to have some really good drought tolerance, shiny leaf, uh, but uh, it's a cross with swamp white, so it could end up with some pH sensitivity down the road. But early on, they look they look really good. Heritage oak, which is reported to be an English oak, burr oak hybrid, but the ones I've looked at look like it might have swamp white in it. We did have some chlorosis in our high pH soils in here, but nice shaped tree, nice leaf on it but it has uh, been brought to the trade as English oak and burr oak and a, a really nice shaped tree, but uh, be careful, maybe the higher pH soils. And then some other just uh, hybrids where there's maybe one, two, three, four, five, they're burr oak, swamp white oak. Actually, there's quite a few of these. It's a common hybrid that, that have been just, I think in seed collection growers have, have collected off this hybrid and sold it probably as, as burr oak. And so you get these, what we call swamp burrs, and they have enough burr oak genetics in them. They're tolerant to high pH. Burr oak and English oak, there's a specimen in the City Park Arboretum. Uh, the burr oak and gamble oak, I showed you the one in the City Park Arboretum there. Burr oak and chinkapin, there's five documented trees that we have of that. And the, there's uh, three of the burr oak white oak, the Quercus macrocorpa, Quercus alba. So we got through all those 26 species and, uh, and uh, the eight hybrids. I hope this information was helpful to you. Uh, I know I had to go through it pretty fast. You have the information on the handout that you can look at online or print you a copy that has a little bit more information on their, uh, how I've recommended them or they're there generally recommended, conditionally recommended, potential unproven, unproven or not recommended, and what that means and a few other comments. So here's my contact information. And oaks have been a passion with me and I've been fortunate enough to plant a lot of the, the different species and cultivars in Fort Collins. So thank you very much.